Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us today in this installment of our 2024 Community Webinar Series. I'm Angela Taylor, Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at LBDA, and I'm delighted to be part of this webinar as it's on one of my favorite topics. Like most LBD families, um, I knew nothing about clinical trials when my father was first diagnosed. And so I didn't know where to start. I knew nothing about clinical trials and I, didn't even know what questions to ask or what the commitment uh, it would require. So if you're where I was back then, this webinar is for you. Our presenter and our panelists will help pull back the curtain a little bit and help you feel more comfortable, prepared. You'll get some practical tips and your questions should be answered about some of the mystifying language of clinical trials. 
Before we get started though, a few words about LBDA. We're a national nonprofit organization and our mission is to optimize the quality of life for those affected by LBD by accelerating awareness, advancing research for early diagnosis and improved care, and by providing comprehensive education and compassionate support. Uh, I'm gonna give you a few housekeeping items as well. You're welcomed and encouraged to submit your questions at any time today using the Q&A button that you'll see at the bottom of your screen. As part of the presentation, uh, our presenter will moderate a Q&A session with two people who have participated in LBD research, at the end of the presentation, then I'll moderate a Q&A session with our speaker for about 10 minutes. This presentation is being recorded and in about a week, you will receive an email that will give you the link to view the recording. Uh, you'll find it uh, and any of our webinars that you might miss on our YouTube channel, LBDA TV. Okay, and you'll find um, Rose has already put that link in uh, in the chat box. So if you uh, need to save that for later use, you can find that uh, right on your screen uh, just by clicking chat. Um, right after today's webinar is over, uh, a brief survey is going to appear on screen asking you for your feedback about today's presentation. This is really important as your feedback helps us shape our educational programs in the future. So please do take a moment and complete the survey. So now let's learn a little bit about who is in the audience today, and that's you. Uh, my colleague Rose is going to launch a polling question, which you will see on screen and you can answer it directly there. So we're gonna give you all um, you know, 15 seconds or so to read that and let us know a little bit about which one of these best represents you. And this will take just a few seconds more, and then we'll be able to get the responses. But your choices are a person with LBD, a care partner for somebody with LBD, another family or friend, a healthcare provider, a researcher, or another type of individual. So Rose, let's see what those responses were. All right, so most of our attendees um, are family caregivers or care partners for somebody with LBD or a family or friend of somebody with the disease. We have a nice group of people with LBD here online and then the smaller numbers are for healthcare providers, researchers and others. All right, so thanks everybody for sharing uh, who you are so that we can consider that as uh, our webinar goes on. Now, I'd like to uh, introduce today's presenter, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Keith Fargo. He's LBDA's Director of Scientific Initiatives. Dr. Frago started his research work in clinical trials over 25 years ago as a clinical research coordinator at the Cincinnati VA Medical Center. Prior to joining LBDA in 2023, Dr. Fargo led the Clinical Studies Initiative for the Alzheimer's Association from 2013 to 2020. He co-chaired the Research Participant Advisory Board of the Alzheimer's Clinical Trial Consortium and was a member of the Medicare Evidence Development and Coverage Advisory Committee. Dr. Fargo is also presented to the Federal Advisory Council on Alzheimer's Research Care and Services on the topic of dementia trials and is a member of the Beyond Study Community Science Partnership Board. Welcome, Keith. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, hi, everybody. I'm really glad to be here with you today. I appreciate you taking the time to join us. Um, and we're going to talk about clinical trials, uh, like Angela said. And, and as she mentioned, we're going to try to demystify things just a little bit for you. Um, now, we only have an hour and we're going to try to pack a lot in. And of course, you know, we can't tell everything about clinical research and clinical trials in an hour. But the goal today really is to demystify a little bit of things that you may have questions about you know, put kind of put a human face on clinical research, you know, it can seem pretty scary. And, you know, we have these visions of doctor's offices and MRIs, you know, these tiny little machines, they, they want to put us in to get the brain scans, etc. Um, and so it can be a little bit intimidating, uh, especially if you don't have um, a good introduction to it. And some of the language um, uh, is not exactly the same. We don't use it in clinical trials exactly the same way that we do necessarily in everyday life. Uh, so the point 
today really is to just kind of help, you know, like I said, take the a little bit of the worry away there and kind of put a human face on trials and just sort of help you know kind of what to expect um, as you think about clinical trials that might be right for you um, or a person that uh, that you care about. So with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and jump right in by sharing my slides. All right, so I can't 100% tell what you guys are seeing, but I believe that this, uh, on my end at least, seems to be working correctly. Um, so I'm going to jump in. Uh, this is me, Keith Fargo. As Angela said, I'm the Director of Scientific Initiatives here at LBDA. Um, and I've been here for about a year and a half now uh, and uh, really, um, really find that I'm enjoying this organization quite a bit. And I think if you guys were to see how we do things behind the scenes, you would be uh, really pleased uh, as well. Uh, now, let's start with some terminology because the terminology can really get in the way. Um, and sometimes we're kind of loosey goosey with these terms as well. You know, one of the things, uh, one of the main terms we use actually is clinical trials. And we even use that kind of loosely. And when I say we, I mean researchers and the research community uh, will use the word clinical trial sometimes when they're actually talking about other kinds of clinical research. Um, and so even at that basic level, you know, right away, we're sort of getting confused with the language a little bit. So I'm going to try to unpack that for you, uh, just a small amount, um, and uh, um, deal with some other terms uh, as well that you may be running across and have some, some questions about. Um, and speaking of questions, as Angela mentioned, as we go, please do pop those questions into the Q&A button um, at any time they come up. We're going to have a Q&A with the panelists in a little bit here, and then we'll do a Q&A with myself um, at the end, but you don't need to wait for that. You can go ahead and put those questions in any time as we are going. So I'm going to start with what is clinical research, because clinical trials are a sub a subtype, if you will, or a category within clinical research. So let's start there. And frankly, a lot of the times when people say clinical trials, um, what they really mean is clinical research. So what is clinical research? Clinical research is about people. Any kind of research that uses people as the participants is clinical research. It's really that simple. We used to use the term um, human subjects research. Um, nobody likes that because you know no one wants to be called a subject, and and frankly, researchers don't like to call people a subject. Um, and it's also uh, minimizing. You know, the reality is a person who participates in research is contributing a great deal um, to the study, and so they're not a subject; they're really a participant in the research. And so for a long time, people stopped, got away from using the term human subjects research and moved to human participants research. But of course, that adds several uh, syllables. It just slows you down and makes it harder to say. So usually these days, we typically go with the term clinical research, uh, which is defined as any kind of human participants research. So when you hear clinical research, we're talking about research with people. Um, just that easy. Now, we can break clinical research down into two subcategories, and we can, we, and these are observational research and interventional research. And I'm not going to read everything that's on the slide here. You can do that, uh, but I'll give you just kind of a, um, you know, colloquial um, overview of what these two types of, of research uh, are all about. So with observational research, the researcher is just observing. Now, that doesn't mean that they won't have any tests or procedures or they're not going to want to do a brain scan or take a blood sample or maybe even take a genetic sample if you agree to that. Uh, so there will be procedures and tests and measurements that are part of observational research, but no intervention. They're not trying to change anything uh, about the course of a person's disease in interventional or in observational research. They're only observing what is happening uh, with an individual as they have this disease and as it progresses over time. 
So for example, in observational research, they might want to do a brain scan at the beginning of a study and then follow you for a couple of years and see what happens with your cognition, uh, with thinking and memory, uh, with sleep, et cetera, and then maybe do another brain scan at the end of that two years. And then they can go back and, and sort of correlate, you know, what's happening in people's brains versus what's happening in their everyday life as they progress along a disease. That kind of study is called a natural history study because you're looking at the natural history of the, we really are looking at the natural course of the disease, if you will. And so that's the that's a natural history study. Um, not just limited to brain scans, of course, there are all kinds of paper and pencil tests that you might need to take. Some of you may have taken a test where you're asked to draw a clock, for example, and put the hands at 10 and two. That's a kind of measurement that might happen in a, a, an observational study. Now, let's contrast that then with interventional studies. With an interventional study, you're trying to intervene in some way to change the course of the, the disease, not just study what is the natural history of the disease, but can we change it? Can we make it better in some way? Now, usually when you think about an interventional study, that's really what's meant by a clinical trial. So it's clinical research, right? Broken down into observational versus interventional. Clinical trials are interventional. So clinical research, and you're trying or testing an intervention. You're putting it to the test. You're giving it a try in clinical research. Clinical trial, when you try that intervention. That's what a clinical trial is. Now, there are many different kinds of interventions that you can put to the test or put to the try in a clinical trial. And the one that we think about the most and most of the examples today will be drug trials. So a lot of times when you say clinical trial, that's where your mind goes first is drug trials. Um, and that's a great example of an interventional study or a clinical trial, but it's important that you should know that there are other kinds of interventions as well, not just drugs. So another kind, there are non-drug interventions such as exercise, surgery, even changing things about a person's environment um, around them, making sure they have more light, for example, making sure that they are surrounded by things that are interesting, but not overwhelming. Those are environmental changes that you also have to put to the test in a clinical trial to know whether or not they're going to be effective or safe. Um, and so that's the point really of clinical trials is testing to see if the intervention is safe and effective. All right, moving on to the next slide, we're gonna take a little bit of a detour here. And this slide is really all about um, clinical trials of drugs. And I wanted to just sort of put clinical trials in a little bit of context for you um, because an individual clinical trial is usually part of a longer series of studies, actually, starting way even before you get into people, uh, starting with cells in a dish, uh, for example, starting with animals in a laboratory, for example. All of that kind of work gets done before you ever even move into um, clinical trials. So clinical trials, remember, are for people. Um, and can you guys see my cursor if I'm pointing on the screen? I think there's a... Uh, a way for me to maybe change what the cursor. Yeah, we can see that, Keith. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Rose. Oops, we're going to go back a slide. There we go. So clinical trials are here in the middle. And there are three phases. You've probably heard of phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials. And as you go, as you move up in those stages of clinical trials, you're really talking about small trials in phase one. Um, usually focused solely on safety because this is the first time you would be testing a drug in human beings. In phase two, you're going to get more, you need more volunteers there, still looking primarily at safety, but now also starting to look at effectiveness. Does the drug work in these individuals, not just is it safe? And then finally, in phase three, 
this will be either many hundreds or sometimes a few thousand um, individuals who are participating in those trials. And for those trials, you're really looking squarely at both effectiveness and safety. Now, if you look at these white lines on this slide, um, each one of these represents a potential new medication. And you can see that as you move to the right in this process, more and more of those potential drugs sort of drop out, if you will. And that's because you can find early on that they're either not safe or not effective, um, either in the preclinical research or in some of those earlier phases of clinical trials. And of course, when that happens, you don't take that further. You really only keep going with the ones that appear to be safe and effective in these earlier trials. And then, of course, you have to have uh, all of that data reviewed by the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. Um, in other countries, there are other agencies that do that. For example, in Europe, that's taken care of by an agency called the European Medicines Agency or the EMA. But in the U.S., it's the FDA. Um, and it takes a lot of time, actually, to get through all of these clinical trials and to get through FDA review. So you may participate in a clinical trial tomorrow for a drug that may not be approved for another seven, 10 years, potentially even longer, depending on how long the trials take. So just something to be aware of. Now, another term that you've probably heard, uh, if you've been thinking about clinical trials, or if you've even gone into a doctor's office to potentially even screen into a clinical trial, you may have heard the term informed consent. Now, this is a research protection. The informed consent process, and that's important, it's a process, you will be asked to sign a document at the end, and that informed consent document is sometimes also referred to as the informed consent. But informed consent really refers to the overall process of informing participants before they join the study what it's all about and whether or not there are any uh, potential benefits and whether or not there are any risks associated with participating in that study. Um, and also, they have to tell you who to contact if you have concerns. And that's because you might find yourself in a situation with a study team where, you know, you have a question about something, but maybe you're afraid to ask the study team, right? Or let's say you're considering dropping out of the study, which you can do at any time for any reason, uh, but you don't necessarily want to, you know, contact the study team, right? Maybe you're afraid of, you know, disappointing them or something. Uh, so there's usually, I shouldn't say usually, always additional contact information in that informed consent document that will be shared with you as part of the informed consent process so that you have another level that you can take, take, take things to if you're ever uncomfortable talking to the study team. And the other part of that is the consent part. And that is to, for you to understand that you are always in control. Even after you sign that informed consent document, that is only saying, I agree today to be in this study. You are free to withdraw that consent literally at any time, at any moment, for any reason, without anyone's permission. So I talked to you about sort of who to contact with additional concerns. You don't even have to do that. Now, I think, you know, the study teams appreciate it when you do because they like to know why a person is uh, withdrawing from a study because that might actually give them some additional information about, you know, were they having side, of, uh, were they having side effects, for example. And if so, it's good for them to know that. Uh, but that is not a requirement. You are literally always in control. And if you wanted to, could just walk away at any moment. So that's important for you to know as you think about uh, these trials because there is some risk um, involved with them. Uh, and so you're all, so just keep making, keep that in mind that you're always in control. Now, another thing that I think it's important for us to, to think about is the difference between study visits and healthcare appointments. And we put this in here because if you volunteer for a, a, a drug study in particular, and you're taking an experimental medication, 
you may have questions about, well, should I keep taking my other medications? Or well, is there a possibility that there might be drug-drug interactions between the study medication and my other medications? You might have all kinds of questions. Um, so that's why it's important to understand that there are study visits and there are healthcare visits. So usually when you see your study doctor, you should absolutely tell them about everything that's going on uh, with your health, but they're probably going to refer you back to your regular physician if you're having some health concerns that don't have anything to do with the study. Uh, and so you will keep your regular healthcare team even while you're participating in a clinical trial. Now, I do want to say that uh, we have a bullet point here. Studies do not provide extended or complete health care. And that is absolutely true. You cannot count on a study team to be your overall health care team. Okay? That being said, research does show that people who are participating in clinical trials regardless of whether they're taking the study medication or taking a placebo, actually have better health outcomes in general than people who are not participating in clinical trials. And the thinking behind that is that it's because you get all of these additional tests and measurements above and beyond your regular health care that are part of the study. And so they may catch something with all of those tests and measurements that may otherwise not have been caught in your regular health care, and then you can treat that. And so that's one thought about why that may be the case, but research does show you have better outcomes, even if you're on the placebo. Now, before we get to our panel, I do want to uh, uh, leave you with some practical tips and tricks as well. And so... I think it's important that you ask some of these questions to the study team before you ever agree to participate. And so they should answer all of these questions for you without any hesitation. And if you're concerned about any of the answers, you should bring that concern up before you participate. So the first thing that you should know is what is the purpose of this study? Are they trying to test a drug? Are they trying to test a new um, uh, laboratory examination, for example? Some studies are looking at laboratory tests. So, for example, studies that take you know, skin biopsy or take a small amount of your cerebrospinal fluid, generally those are actually testing out that, um, that what we would call an assay or laboratory test. Um, now, that being said, many of the drug trials also use those tests, okay, but it should be clear to you whether the purpose is to study the test or the purpose is to study a drug or other intervention. Um, and speaking of tests and treatments, um, it should be clear to you ahead of time exactly what kinds of tests are being used in the study and what the treatment is. Now they can't tell you whether it's going, whether you're going to get the study medication or whether you'll be taking a placebo, but certainly they can tell you how many people will be taking the study medication and how many people will be taking placebo. And they can tell you all about the study medication. So ask those questions. Um, you definitely want to know if there are any benefits to being in the study and more importantly, what are the risks of participating in this study? All research does carry some risk. That is just a fact of life. Even um, drugs that have already been approved actually carry some risk. So when you go to the, the pharmacy and pick up a prescription, it's going to tell you all about the possible side effects, right? Well, in these clinical trials, they're just discovering what those side effects are. And so there is risk associated with this, and you should understand what your doctor understands about that risk. Also, ask about costs. Uh, for most clinical trials, there will not be any additional cost to you over and above your regular healthcare costs. Um, they're not going to charge you to take the study drug. They're not going to charge you generally for any kinds of tests that they do as part of the study. But certainly ask because you don't want to be surprised with anything like that later. You want to know ahead of time. And then finally, how long is the study? Are we signing up for a, a one-day study or are we signing up for, you know, 
20 minutes in the doctor's office just to take a few tests? Or are we signing up for a two to three year long study where I'm gonna have to go to the doctor's office twice a year for three years? Those are very different kinds of commitments and you wanna be clear heading into any study, what is the time commitment that they're asking for from you? All right, with that, uh, we're going to, I'll briefly mention other kinds of studies, and then we're going to bring on the panel. So uh, we talked about natural history studies already. If you go back, you know, think back just a few slides ago, that is a kind of observational study. So not a clinical trial, but it is clinical research. There are caregiver studies, and these can be observational studies about caregivers and caregiving or they can be interventional studies. I'm gonna actually give you an example coming up uh, after our panel about an interventional study for caregivers that is coming soon. Uh, you can take surveys. Um, surveys are very easy. Most of them can be done online, um, although you may take some surveys in person as well. Um, it is clinical research because it's research using human beings, but it's not a clinical trial, it's just a survey. Um, there's epidemiology research. That's research into how frequent is a disease in the community. How many Americans, for example, have LBD? We find the answers to those questions through epidemiological research. And finally, there's market research. And market research is more about you know, how acceptable is something to the general public. Let's say we discover a new treatment, but it's an injection instead of a pill. Are people going to accept an injectable treatment or do they really, really want that pill? And so that's what market research is about. Again, not a trial, but it is a kind of clinical research. Um, all right. <laughs> all right. I got the timing a little bit wrong. I apologize for that. Before we bring the panel in, we are actually going to do, a, I'm going to show you several ways to find clinical trials. The, so that may be a question you have. All right, I'm really interested in these trials, but where do I even get started? One way is through a website called clinicaltrials.gov. And as the name suggests, this is a government website. Um, so I will tell you that it can be a little clunky sometimes to use, and it changes slowly, like anything having to do with government. There are all kinds of regulations that you have to keep in mind, and these things just don't change on a dime. Uh, but this is a good way to find clinical trials. And I'm showing you here on the right um, the search box that you will see when you go to clinicaltrials.gov. And of course, you can type in what kind of condition or disease you're looking for. You can use other kinds of terms. If you're interested in a specific study drug, you can type the name of that drug into um, this box that I'm highlighting now. You can also choose, do I want to see all studies or do I only want to see the ones that are currently recruiting or maybe recruiting in the future? I would encourage you to select that um, recruiting and not yet recruiting. Otherwise, you're going to be seeing a lot of studies that are already over and that you can no longer participate in. And then you would click that search button. Um, that's going to take you to this page then where you're gonna to start to see a listing and these, these look like cards. That's the kind of um, uh, format they use on clinicaltrials.gov. You'll see these cards, each one of which is an individual study. And if you find one that you're interested in, uh, you can click on that study to learn more about it. And I'm gonna show you where that takes you in a moment. But before we get there, I wanna draw your attention to this. You will find some studies that are not yet recruiting. That's good to keep in mind for later. You can come back and look again. Um, or what you could do if you're not interested in doing that is just click on this uh, button here to get rid of the not yet recruiting studies and narrow those search results down to just the studies that are ready to take participants today. So if you click on one of the study names, that's going to take you to another page. Uh, with much more information about that study. There are multiple tabs across the top. So you can look at the study details. You can look at a table view, which makes this a little easier to digest, although there's still a ton of information in it. 
Um, this study is just re it's recruiting now, so there are no results posted yet for it. But if there were results posted, you could click on that tab and it would show you those results. I will let you know they're not easily digestible. So if you go to clinicaltrials.gov and you find a study and it has results and you click on that tab, it's really going to show you a long table with lots of statistics in it. It generally doesn't give you a you know, sort of a narrative description of what the results were. It's mostly data. Um, so it may or may not be useful for you, but definitely useful for the research community. Now, that's one way to find clinical trials, um, and it's a really valuable way to find clinical trials, uh, but it also takes a lot of work on your end, um, and it gives so much information that it can sometimes be difficult to kind of wade through all of that and find the information that you're actually looking for. So we've tried to make things a little bit easier for you at our website, um, lbda.org. And I'm going to walk you through now how you can find clinical trials at LBDA's website. So I'm showing you our front page. And in this example, we're, we're clicking on research across the nav bar here. I'm hoping you can see my cursor. And then when you click on research, you get this drop down menu. And what you want to do is select clinical studies. And I'm going to show you in a minute what that page looks like. But I'm also going to tell you right now, keep an eye down here at this Louis trial tracker as well, because we're going to come back to that in a minute. But to find the clinical studies quickly, you're going to click on clinical studies. That's going to take you then to this next page, which has a listing of all of the clinical trials for people with LBD that are currently recruiting. Now, what's different about this and clinicaltrials.gov? Well, this is a curated list. If you search within clinicaltrials.gov, you're actually going to find a lot of trials that are looking for people who have DLB uh, uh, or PDD, but aren't necessarily interested in the dementia piece of that. And so you'll find a lot of studies that really have more to do with movement um, and are, you know, they may be kind of lumping you in with you know, sort of Parkinson's in general. Um, and that may or may not be what you're looking for if you're a person who has Lewy body dementia. So what we do is we curate all of those studies and make sure that we're only showing you the studies that are relevant for you. Um, and so that's what you'll find listed here. And we also only show currently recruiting studies. So if you find a study here, you can be confident that it is a recruiting study today unless they have stopped enrollment or stopped recruiting and haven't told us yet. That's always possible. But we curate these to be currently recruiting studies. Now, uh, we're going to use some ex specific examples later, and so I'll show you a little bit more how to use this at that time. But now I want to draw your attention to Louis Trial Tracker, and that's what I showed you before, the other button that you can click on that drop down. And this is a way that you can actually fill out a survey for us, and we do not share your information with anyone. This survey is going to ask you some questions, things like how old are you? Are you a man or a woman? Do you have LBD? Are you a caregiver for someone with LBD? It's also going to ask you what kinds of things uh, you care about when it comes to clinical trials. What are your preferences? Are you interested in drug trials? Are you interested only in non-drug trials? Are you willing to give a blood sample? Are you not willing to give a blood sample, et cetera, et cetera. And then what that allows us to do is send information to you about clinical trials that may fit your preferences. Now, what we do is every quarter, we send out a, an email with clinical trial updates to everyone who's a Louis Trial Tracker member to make sure that you're all seeing information about all of the studies that we are listing. But we also periodically send targeted emails based on those survey results. So for example, if a new study opens up that's looking for people who are, let's say 65 and older, but you are only 63, we're not going to send you a targeted email about that study because it, you wouldn't fit 
right? Uh, but we would still make that send that study around in that quarterly email. So I would really encourage you if you're interested in keeping track of the new trials and being notified when they launch both drug trials and non-drug clinical research, um, please consider signing up for Luby Trial Tracker. All right, and now I'm gonna actually invite on our panelists, um, Todd and Don, and we're gonna talk uh, for probably about 10 minutes about their experience in clinical trials. Um, and then I'll take you through some very specific uh, examples. So with that, let me stop sharing. And Todd and Don, Don, are you, there you go. So Rose, if you could please highlight Don for us as well. Thank you very much. All right, Todd, Don, thank you both for being here today. And the reason that we asked you to join is because I know that you both have experience in clinical research. Um, and I think that the audience would appreciate hearing from you, you know, what your experience has been. Um, so I do have some questions for you. And Todd, I'm, I'm gonna start with you, Todd, if that's okay. Uh, so uh, I know that you're, and you won't mind us telling people that you're a person living with, with Lewy body dementia, right? And so um, I understand that you've been discussing some clinical trials with your doctors. Um, and you've even been in touch with at least one clinical trial team. Um, do you mind telling us about that experience and what that's been like for you? Sure. Uh, I originally uh, signed up for the the Shimmer study, the CT1812 study, uh, reached out to them, was a really simple process. It was just an email uh, and they were incredibly responsive, got back to me right away and then went through the screening process uh, very quickly. And I said, hey, I'm going to have to talk to my doctor about this. Uh, so I reached out to my neurologist and, and she actually asked me to put the brakes on because she said that there was another study coming up uh, called Rewind, which based on her research and information presented to her, looked to be a little more promising, not that one was better than the other, uh, but she liked the, the concept that they were going to provide medication for, I believe, six to eight months. Uh, no additional cost after the study uh, concluded. And she saw that as a, a great benefit and had heard very positive uh, feedback so far from the, the research presented to her. I mean, great. That's terrific. Thank you. And, and I think if there's something I can point out, you know, from that um, to the audience, really two things that I think you mentioned there. First of all, uh, make sure you know what's going to happen in the study, right? So Todd learned that as the part of the one study, there would be additional medication provided after the end of the study. Uh, that's usually called an open label extension for the audience, meaning that even if you took, well, regardless, usually it's regardless of it, whether you took placebo or the active study drug during the study, everyone gets a chance afterward to continue on the investigational medication. And so then that affected what his doctor had to say. And that's the other piece I wanted to point out was talk to your doctor, definitely get their opinion uh, before you sign up for anything. Uh, and actually a third thing, you know, you were able to tell the folks at the first study team, I'm not interested. My doctor said, you know, we want to look into this other thing first. So let's please hold. So that's an example of where the participant is really always in control. Okay? At any time, you can decide not to participate in a study, even if you've already started that study, which I know wasn't the case here, but that's true even if you've already started a study. Um, so uh, what has been your experience so far, Todd, in terms of finding clinical trial information? How did you learn about these studies? And what have the interactions been like with the study teams? Uh, for me, I'm a bit of a, a old school IT geek, so searching was relatively easy looking at the uh, the clinicaltrials.gov, but I ultimately found that using the LBDA's site was much easier to digest, provided more relevant information to me, and I love getting the updated emails. Uh, when reaching out and working with the teams, it's been extraordinarily pleasant. Uh, everyone I've worked with has been wonderful. Most of it's run through uh, Barrow Neurological here in Phoenix, which is one of the centers of excellence. Uh, and I have uh, one of my neurologists who's there. And it's been super. I mean, everyone has been incredibly kind, very responsive, uh, and open to any kind of dialogue, questioning, et cetera, and working with my neurologist, which 
to me was uh, a huge bonus. Great, great. Thank you. All right, fantastic. So, Don, I'm going to move to you next. Um, I, I again, I understand you're, you know, you've been very open with us. I understand your dad passed from Louie. Um, and so you participated in research, I believe, as a caregiver. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the research that you participated in? Sure. So I did a pilot study uh, for Persevere, which is a peer mentor support and caregiver education program. Um, so basically where past caregivers were partnered with current caregivers, it was a 16-week study. We met one time per week. And um, basically my role was to support, provide guidance, um, resources, and a safe space to share for my mentee. Yeah, so, that's, so that's terrific. So this is actually, so you were an experienced caregiver and the idea behind this uh, particular trial, the uh, I think it was called Preparing to Persevere maybe, uh, or Get Ready to Persevere. I don't recall the name of it exactly. Uh, and in that particular study, what they were doing is a trial of this caregiver intervention, right? So they were, they were. So this is an example of where a person has a, an idea. I think that hooking up the experienced caregivers with people who are brand new to caregiving may be beneficial, but then you have to actually put that to the test. And so you were part of the group that was testing that. So this was a trial for a caregiver intervention. Um, how did you find the trial and what was your experience in um, joining the trial? Actually, um, Louis Body Dementia Association reached out to me, um, let me know that they thought I would be a good match for this trial. And it was actually done through Rush University. So they just put me in contact with the right people. And kind of like Todd's experience, I mean, the team was Phenomenal, very supportive. Um, it was very easy to enroll. Uh, the study was very detailed. We were given, you know, binders and all kinds of information. So I felt very well equipped. Uh, we did go through a training process uh, before we took on our mentees. Um, but yeah, I felt very, um, very supported, very well equipped to begin the study. Good, good, terrific. And then, um, I actually am interested in hearing from both of you one thing that surprised you about participating in research. So going in, you had sort of, you know, idea X, but then when you got there, you found out what, you know, it was reality Y or reality Z. Um, so, and uh, so Todd, maybe let's go to you first. And for me, I really didn't find much that was, you know, really surprising to me because I'm so absorbed in getting the information, I guess you would say, uh, that trying to learn as much as I could before I even signed up to participate. So I think that's important. Do your own personal investigation to try and minimize the surprises that you may see coming into a study. Yeah, great advice, really good advice. So Don, anything that surprised you and, and any piece of advice that you might like to share with the audience? Sure. Yes, I was surprised how easy it was to actually enroll and get started in a study. I personally learned more about the disease, um, just going through all the training that I did. Um, but yeah, it was just a great sense of satisfaction by helping somebody else. And my mentee and I, I mean, even though this study was three years ago, we still talk regularly, uh, at least once a week to this day. So yeah, it was it was a great experience. Yeah, that sounds terrific. All right. Well, I would like to, again, thank you both. Um, and, and I know that was relatively short, but in the interest of making sure we have time to have Q&A at the end as well, I'm going to go ahead and let both of you guys go for now. And uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing uh, with the rest of the group today. Uh, all right, so everybody, big round of applause, huge thanks for um, Todd and Don. Um, not easy to get on and tell people about your experiences. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to my slide deck now. All right, and now we're going to go through a few real-world examples uh, relatively quickly here. 
Um, so one of the studies that you are going to see and hear a lot about from LBDA is called Rewind. Now, this is a, we're going to go through four examples today, okay? Two drug studies, which we'll take spend a little bit more time on, and then one study uh, that is currently recruiting, but not a drug study. It's a natural history study. And then we're also going to take a look at a study that is coming soon, but we'll go through those last two pretty quickly. Um, so for Rewind, this is a study, uh, again, a drug study. And uh, if you're interested in this, I'll show you how to find it through our web page. So again, you go back to our front page, click research in that navigation bar at the top. That's going to open the drop down menu, click on clinical studies. That will take you to this page. Um, and if you're interested in Rewind, it's right up here at the top. And so you would click on read more. I'll tell you, you can also click on the name of the study here, uh, but you know it's probably easiest just to remember that you can click that button and go ahead and click on it. And when you do, then that's gonna take you to the, what we call the landing page for the Rewind study on lbda.org. Um, this has more information about the study. It's going to give you a brief overview of what the purpose of the study is. It's going to tell you about what's involved in the study. So just real quickly here for this one, you start to see that there's going to be a screening visit. Uh, you may take a study medication. In this case, it's called nephlimapamod. You may say that three times fast. You may take a placebo. If so, that information is going to be in here as well. And then let's pretend like I'm scrolling down on the web page, but I'm going to click to go to the next slide. So if you were to scroll down on that web page, you would see more information, including who can participate, right? So here's an example where the person has to be at least 55 years of age. So again, if you were 53, not the right study for you, but if you're 55 or older, you may potentially qualify to be in the study. In addition to that, we're going to show you exactly where the study is happening. So you can look by state, and these are in alphabetical order. Um, and then within each state, it's going to tell you the cities in that state where the, the study is happening. And not only that, but within that city, what is actually the name of the institution um, or the study location in that city? Even more detail, we're going to tell you exactly the name of the person who you need to contact at that study team to learn more about the study and start that screening process to see if you might qualify. And along with their name, we're going to give you their email address and their phone number if we have them both. Sometimes we only have one. In that case, you'll only get the email address or the phone number. But if we have them both, we give them to you both. And then if I was to scroll down again, you would see what's on the next slide. Uh, and that's actually this study we find out toward the bottom of the page uh, that this app study actually has some European study sites as well. Uh, one of the questions we got early on uh, when people were registering for the webinar was, can you participate if you're Canadian? Uh, so I'll generalize that to, can you participate if you live outside the US? Uh, and the answer is yes but it depends on the study, okay? So every study is a little bit different. Some have sites outside the U.S. or accept people who are from outside the U.S. Others do not. So it's just study by study. We also show you who the sponsor of the study is. Uh, in this case, the sponsor is named EIP Farm Pharma. Sponsor generally means the company that's responsible for running the trial, okay? Uh, and in this case, the study is paid for or funded by the National Institute on Aging, which is part of the NIH or the National Institutes of Health. Going on to then another example, uh, there's another phase two clinical trial happening today called SHIMMER. And SHIMMER is another one that we uh, people ask us a lot about. And so we have a page for SHIMMER as well. Again, you would start at the front page open that drop down, click on clinical studies. That's going to take you back to the page where we list all the studies out, scroll down past rewind in this case, and you're going to get to shimmer. Again, click on read more. That's going to take you to this page with more information, this case about shimmer. 
So you can start to see some of the inclusion and exclusion criteria down here. In this case, for example, you need to be between the age of 50 and 85. Uh, it's going to tell you that this is a drug study. In particular, the name of this drug is CT1812 um, and what the study is about. Scroll down some more, you're going to see those study sites just like you did um, with the prior study. All right, and then if you scroll down more, you're going to again see those, you know, the end of the alphabet, if you will, and then the study sponsor, which in this case is Cognition Therapeutics. Um, again, though, this study was funded by the National Institute on Aging, which is part of the National Institutes of Health. All right, so now these last two studies, we're gonna go through really quickly. Uh, so this one is called BEYOND. Now I included this one for a couple of reasons. Uh, the BEYOND study is a great example of an observational study. So there is not a drug involved in this study. It's just looking at the disease over time. And in particular, the reason I'm very excited about this study is because it's looking at a couple of groups that we generally don't have as much information on. And that is uh, people who are under the age of 65 when they first develop their dementia symptoms. That's called young onset or younger onset dementia. Um, and people from underrepresented ethnic and racial groups. Um, unfortunately, researchers have not been very good about studying everyone when they do these studies, um, but this study is specifically trying to do that and really looking at from people, in people from diverse backgrounds, is the disease the same? And the reason for that is because when we have medications, we have to know that they're going to work for everyone, not just people of European descent in the United States. And so very excited about this study. This one is currently recruiting. You can go find out more about that at lbda.org slash beyond, or you can just do what I showed you in the last couple of examples, which is go to the front page, click on that you know, research link, get that drop down menu, click on clinical studies, scroll down and you're gonna find beyond, um, just like you did the other two studies. And then finally, I'm gonna leave you with a coming soon before we jump into the Q&A period here. And you, know, you heard from Dawn that she participated in a caregiver study called, uh, I believe it was Preparing to Persevere, I can't recall exactly, but it was the pilot study, which is a small study to get you ready for a larger study. You can kind of learn what's working, what doesn't work, you know, what do we need to tweak and change to make sure that when we do this in a larger group that it's, you know, working the way we expect it to. And now they're just about ready to launch that larger study, and it is called Persevere. Now, we do not have a link for this yet, because if you remember what I told you earlier, we only provide links out to studies that are already recruiting. But stay tuned on this one. If you sign up for Louis Trial Tracker, you're going to get it in your email. Yeah? And if you, want, if you don't want to do that, you can certainly come back and check that research uh, studies page periodically, and you're going to see it when it does launch. So with that, I would just like to say thank you. And I believe we do have some time for some questions here at the end. Thank you, thank you so much. That was a really fantastic presentation. I have a couple of questions here um, that um, I would like to pose. I think we've got an opportunity for two or three questions if we can make them uh, fairly quick answers. Um, one question was, is are there trials for people who are in more advanced stages such as severe dementia? Uh, what opportunities should people look for there? Yeah, the answer is yes, but fewer. Okay? And I'll just briefly explain that. Um, a lot, it's, uh, it's harder to see whether a drug is working and harder to see whether the drug is safe in people who have already progressed to a more advanced stage. So in general, researchers are usually looking earlier in the disease when they do these drug trials, but there absolutely are studies for people who are more advanced. Harder to find, maybe fewer of them, may not be one right now, but they do happen. Thank you. Uh, what is the projected time between when a 
clinical trial ends and is successful and the availability of that treatment? Yeah, great question. And that the answer to that is it's going to vary um, depending on a number of factors. If it's a phase one or a phase two trial, well, then, of course, it still has to get all the way through that phase three stage before it can even go to FDA for potential approval. And those phase three trials can last and usually do last several years. The, uh, the study does. And then, of course, the study team has to evaluate all of that data. Um, and usually there are two phase three clinical trials, actually, before they even go to the FDA. And so that can add additional time as well. So you're talking usually years. If you're just finishing up a phase three study, it may be one to two years. If you're talking about a phase two study, you may be looking at more like five or seven years, but it varies. Um, I have a really good question here. How long should a person wait to participate in another study after completing a prior study? Is there yeah. a rule of thumb or a guideline? That is a really great question. And so, again, that's going to vary by study, right? Um, particularly if you're talking about drug studies. So usually if you're in one drug study the and then you decide to start a different drug study after you've completed the first one, the researchers in the second study will ask you to wait for a period of time. And they may use the term washout uh, for, uh, to describe that period. And the concept there is they want to make sure that any of the drug that may still be in your body or any of the effects that you may still be having from that earlier drug um, are finished before you start the new trial. And that's so that they can ensure that any safety signal they get, if you have an, uh, an adverse event or side effect is really what we would call that, um, or any benefit that you might get in the new trial, the only way they can be certain that that's from the new drug is if there has been that period of time between the two trials. But again, that's gonna vary um, by study, but usually it's going to be at least three months. Great, thank you. Um, boy, we have so many questions and we have only time for one other. Um, and th I think this is also a really important question. Do you need volunteers that do not have LBD? Ooh, that is a good question. And the answer is yes. But again, it's going to depend on the study, right? So these drug studies that we looked at earlier, those particular drug studies are only looking for people who have DLB. So those studies aren't even looking for people with PDD, but they have a very specific goal in mind, which is testing these drugs in people with DLB to see how well they work. Now, if you go er in earlier studies, such as uh, uh, the phase one studies, sometimes they are looking for people who don't have the disease. As a matter of fact, frequently they are looking for people who don't have the disease. And if you are thinking about those natural history studies like beyond, um, or if you're thinking about a caregiver study like persevere, they usually are looking for people who do not have disease. Um, some of those studies, particularly the natural history studies, will be looking for both because they want to see what happens over time in a person who has the disease and compare that to what happens to people over that same time period who do not have the disease. And so they absolutely do need both. All right. Thank you. So unfortunately, while we have lots of questions, we are out of time. Uh, on behalf of LBDA, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. And then especially importantly, I'd like to thank our panelists, Todd and Don, for sharing their time and their stories with us. Uh, given the importance of finding more treatments for DLB, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity again to mention the two phase two drugs, drug trials you heard about today, Shimmer and Rewind. So to learn more, again, please follow the links that, that Rose already shared in the chat. As a reminder, you're gonna receive an email in about a week with the link to the recording of this webinar. And we invite you to also check out our event website, our, our event calendar on our website and look at that regularly. You're gonna find that on the bottom of our homepage and it's gonna include details about upcoming events and how to register. And don't forget, like I mentioned before, please take a minute to complete the survey you're gonna see as soon as the webinar ends. You can help inform our educational content in the future. 
So we hope to see you all again. And thank you very much for joining us today.